Praise the Lord. Amen. We're glad to be in the house of God this morning. Thank you so much for those that have joined us for in-house for our Sunday school class today. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we want to go to the Lord in prayer, ask God to touch and minister. We do have some that are sick, uh, some that are on the road traveling. want to continue to be praying for them. I have some that are homesick. Some, we do have some that's in the hospital. So a lot of things are going on. Uh, they've uh, uh, told us that uh, COVID is taking us uh, a spike back, so we definitely want to continue to be praying. Uh, just for your knowledge, uh, we are we continue spray uh, the sanctuary. We continue to uh, keep things clean around here, uh, and the fact of for sickness purposes. So just keep that in mind, and uh, come to the house of God as you're able to be in the house of God, because it's it's great to be here, to be around brothers and sisters in Christ to be able to uh, encourage one another, lift one another up. Uh, that is a big part of what it is to be a Christian. Amen? And I'm glad to be able to be in the house of God today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to touch and minister in our Sunday school class. If you've got a prayer request, let me know by lifting your hand. God knows every need. If you're on our live stream, you can text the keyword prayer to 205-642-8744 because we want to partner together in prayer. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Fathers, we come to you today again. Thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for this great opportunity that you've allowed us to come to worship and praise you. Father, today I pray that you'll touch and minister the hearts and lives of each one that's in-house, those that live feet alike. Father, I pray that you'd move in a mighty way, open the windows of heaven, and pour out an anointing and a blessing upon this service. Touch every member, those that are here. You've seen the uplifting of the hands. You've seen the hearts and lives of each one. And, Father, we want to praise you and we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. This morning, the title of our lesson that we're going to be looking at is Dedicating the Temple. Dedicating the Temple. Uh, just for a history lesson, we was talking about history a few moments ago. Just for a history, as the children of Israel was roaming in the wilderness, they had a tabernacle, basically a pop-up tent. It was a lot more elaborate than that, but that's what they had. They had a, a tabernacle that is a tent. They would take down, they would put it back up, they'd take it down, they'd put it back up, they maneuvered it around, done what they needed to do. Uh, it was still very ornate. It was still very elaborate. It was still uh, it, uh, it was still in a fashion of that they decorated it greatly, a lot more than they did their homes. So it's something that you really want to think about as you're looking at this. Now we're talking about the temple. You go from the tabernacle, which was the tent, to the temple, which is a uh, a stationary facility, a stationary building, and that's what we're looking at. Remember, David, in the last couple of lessons, David wanted to build the temple. He wanted to build the temple of God. That was in his heart to do so. However, he was not able to because of a lot of the things that had happened in his life. So that passed down to Solomon, his son, and he had told, he had announced it and said that Solomon would do that. Solomon would, would succeed David. We've talked about that, how all of that transpired. And so those are great lessons that you want to go back and look at. But this morning we're going to be talking about dedicating the temple. In that, our, an idea that we must look at is we've got to desire, we need to prepare, and we need to make room for the presence of God in our lives. We need to desire the presence of God. We need to desire the presence of God in our life, and we need to prepare for the presence of God in our life. If I'm going to come over to your house, okay, here, uh, here, there's been several times that we've gone over to Brother Larry and Sister Deborah's house. The, all the praise team's gone over, and we've, there's been times we've had lunch over there. Uh, there was a time, I think we had a fish fry, I think we had a fish fry one time over there. Just different things. How would it look, how would it seem, how would it be if we just showed up one day and Brother, De Brother Larry and Sister Deborah had not prepared anything? I'm not talking about the food. We show up, they're still in their PJs. You, you see what I'm saying? Nothing has been prepared. 
everything's still, you know, they're, they're still lounging in the recliner. Brother Larry, he's stretched back in that recliner. He's snoring. And we show up for lunch because we've been invited. Here's the thing that we've got to understand is we, first of all, when we wake up in the morning, we need to desire the presence of God in our lives. Amen? We need to have a desire for that. And in, in desiring to doing so, we need to start preparations for that. Well, what does it mean to prepare? We need to enter into his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. We need to bless the name of Jesus. We need to exalt his name. Those are things that we do to prepare to be in the presence of God. When we, when we allow distractions to keep us from preparing, how else do we prepare? Reading the word of God, praying, seeking the face of the Father. Those are things that we need to be doing and when we, oh, you know, I, I read scripture in the morning, but you know, this morning I got a lot to do. I'm going to push that to maybe about lunchtime. And they, I, I, I surely, surely, I, I can read a chapter at lunch. It'd be all right. Well, lunchtime comes, and what are we all doing? Russing, rustling around and everything else. I, I'll just wait to bedtime. Well, bedtime comes, and what, I don't know about y'all, but me, when my head hits that pillow, I'm gone. I'm not. I'm not interested when I when my head hits that pillow. I'm not interested in in in, in any conversations. I'm not in. I'm going to sleep. You you see what I'm saying? And so that's the thing is if we do not make that time, if we do not make that time for God. And and, and I'm gonna go so far as to say we need to schedule that time for God. You schedule doctor's appointments, right? You schedule those things that's important. You have to be at work at a certain time. You've got to be at work at 8 a.m. You've got to be at work at 9 a.m. If you've got to be at work at 8 a.m., you know that you can't leave at 8.05 to make it, right? I know some people try to do that, but it doesn't work. We're not back to the future. What we need to understand is we need when we have an appointment of a time frame, we do what we need to to make it there. And so there's nothing really wrong. There's nothing wrong with scheduling and saying, okay, I'm getting up at 5 a.m. I'm going to get my coffee. And then at 5.15, from 5.15 to 5.45, that's God's time. From 5.15 to 6.15, that's God's time. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the preparation time. And then we need to make room for God. How do you make room for God? You know, when if you've got if you've got somebody that's moving into your house, you've got to move things around. I remember when it, it, it's been 20 years ago, but I remember when me and Sister Carrie when we got married, we had never neither one of us had ever lived in the home that we moved into. We both moved into that house together. And so prior to us Prior to us moving in, we start moving our furniture in. We start bringing things into that house. Well, there was some of the things that there was duplicates of, and something had to go. D do you make, does that make sense? And so when we move the presence of God, when we're making room for Him in our lives, sometimes there's things that's got to go. What addiction do we hold on to? And, and when you say the word addiction, a lot of times people think, Drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, nicotine, things like that. Well, caffeine is an addiction. We don't like to think about that, but caffeine is an addiction. We don't like to think about that, eat, that eating too much, that's an addiction. D do you see what I'm saying? And so there's more things that's, that's in our lives that we could make sure that we let go of. I'm not saying that if you eat, that's a problem because homeboy right here likes to eat. But the thing that we've got to understand is are we allowing anything to get ahead of our relationship with God? But what we've got to realize and understand is the basic mentality of our lives is, is we've got to make sure we have room for God in our lives. We've got to make sure we have room for God in our lives. We also need to explore of God at the dead.
purification of the temple and respond reverently to his presence. This building right here does not look like the temple that they had, that Solomon's temple. But this building right here is still a representation of the temple of God. Now we all know, we, we, we got an understanding. Where is the presence of God at in our lives today? Right here. Okay? The, a tornado could come through and, te- and tear this building down. We can still have church, what, right? We can still be the church, right? Because the church is not this building. The church is you and I. And that's what we must realize, and that's what we've got to hold on to, is we need to realize that that there needs to be a reverence, even though this building is just a facility made by man, we must understand this is still a representation, a symbolic representation of the temple of God. There must be reverence to God in this place. Why? Because the presence of God draws sinners to Christ. Did you know that when we come to church, it's not about you receiving a physical healing in your life. It's not about you receiving a spiritual healing. The biggest thing that we want to happen is somebody come to the house of God and somebody get saved. Somebody rededicate their heart and their life to God. Somebody, I'm just going to go real with you. Somebody, a Christian can be suffering, and I say that, suffering with cancer in their lives. And if that cancer happens to take that Christian's life, they're going to receive their healing. They're going on the other side of glory, and they're going to receive a healing. Okay? The main thing that we need in our churches today is people getting saved. That is what it's all about. It's secondary for somebody, a Christian, to receive their sight. It's secondary for a Christian to receive healing from cancer. I love it when those things happen. Don't misunderstand me. But we must understand, being in the presence of God is about drawing sinners to Christ. Amen? So let's go on and look at this this morning. Take a look at 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And verse 18, 2 Chronicles 6 and 18. But will God indeed dwell with man on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. This, This building cannot contain the presence of God. You and I in our soul cannot contain the entirety of the presence of God. And that's how mag- magnificent God is. And we must realize that when we are entering in the presence of God, we're not going to be ab- able to absorb all that God has for us in our lives. Amen? So in our, in our Sunday school lesson today, the time has come for the dedication of the temple built by Solomon. Before the dedication of the temple, the establishment of the Ark of the Covenant, the most holy place inside the temple, the priests, the Levites, the singers, all of these things has already taken place. And they're setting things up and setting the stage for the dedication of the temple. The presence of God is a a glory, as a cloud has been manifested numerous times throughout the Old Testament prior to the temple dedication. But Solomon tells us in Second Chronicles 6 and verse 1, he says, The Lord hath said that he will dwell in the thickness of the darkness or the dark cloud. It's in the presence of the holy place. So what we must realize and understand is that by, while, while the fact remains that nobody is going to see the face of God, John chapter 1 verse 18 says that no one has seen God at any time. Exodus 33 also tells us that Moses experienced a time of being in the presence of God, yet he never still seen the face of God. Many times people will seek seek the power of God. What can God do for me? But when we seek the very face and the very presence 
of God. We're seeking not just what can God do for me, but we're also seeing, seeking all of who God is. I don't want to just seek what God's going to do for me today. Sure, there's things I want God to do. Is there, is there things that we all need God, would like for God to do in our lives? Absolutely. Some might need a physical healing. Some need a financial touch. Some need an emotional, a mental touch. Some needs a breakthrough. Some needs chains broken. When we come into the house of God, we need to have an expectation that God is going to do those things. When we come in, we need to have that expectation. But we also need to have the expectation that God's going to do so much more. We look a lot of times at the carnality of things, but God is wanting to look further than the carnality. God is wanting to look at the spirituality of things. We're constantly, we base our need on the fact of the things that we can touch, the things that we can, the carnality, that those aspects of life, we base what we need on those things. But how many times have we sought God and said, you know what, God, today I don't need anything from you. I just want to sit here and just be in your presence. I just want to be in the presence of God. It's not about what's God going to do for me today, but it's about just being in the presence of God. That is something that we need to really hold on to in our lives. Solomon's pr prayer of praise found in 2 Chronicles. Uh, you can turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. Take a look at verse 1 and 2 for just a moment. 2 Chronicles 6, verse 1 and 2. It says this, Then said Solomon, The Lord has said that he will dwell in the thick darkness. Verse 2. But I have built you an excellent, or excuse me, an exalted house, a place for you to dwell forever. It's remarkable that before Solomon addressed the people or even prayed a prayer, first he spoke to God. He was facing towards the Ark of the Covenant, the holy place, and he says, I have built a place dedicated and exalted for God to dwell and live forever. Then as soon as he's done that, in verse 3, Solomon turns towards the people. He blessed them as they stood in response. Verse 3 says, the king turned around and he blessed the assembly of Israel while the assembly of Israel stood in the presence of God. Then we also find that he declares in verse 4, he says, Blessed be the name, but blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David, my father, saying. What we're reminded here, what we're what we're focusing on here, is that the even at the dedication of the temple, the focus is on God. It's not on the building. The focus is on God. It's not on, on, in, on one individual person, but it is focused on God and the relationship that God has with his people. It's not the building. Now, I want you to, I want you to hear me on this. In-house, live feet alike, I want you to hear me on this. Now, we've only been here eight years at this at this church for eight years. We have put, just ourselves, we've put a lot of work in this building, okay, on the property. Some of you, Brother Emery, you've been here about two days longer than I have. Brother Chuck, you've been here about two days longer than I have. Y'all have worked on this property and worked on this building. There's a lot of effort has been put into this. Several of us, we worked on that sound booth. I'm very proud of the way we turned out on that sound booth. There's more room back there. 
things are set up. We've got, we've got a good setup back there. I've showed some pastor friends of ours. They've come in and they've seen that. Man, I need you to come to my church and do the same thing. Here's the thing. These storms has come through the last few days. It would have been nothing for, I'm just, I'm just telling you, it would have been nothing for a tornado to just wipe this building out, right? Would it be sad that the building is gone? Sure it would. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, emotional attachment to a building. There's a lot of emotional ta- attachment because, because we, this is where we gather. This is where we worship. This is where we join one another together, okay? It's an emotional attachment because some of your children has been baptized in this baptismal pool. It's an emotional attachment because right about in this area here, that's where you, you remember when you knelt down there and that's where you received a great touch from God. Some change was broken that day that you knelt down right. Or it might have been right over in this area you stood and and there was a, a breakthrough happened in your life. You might have been right there and, and, a, and a healing happened. There, there's things that's happened in this building. But what Solomon is telling his people, he's telling them, he's saying, hey, look, this is about God and the relationship God has with his people. It's not about the material things. Whether we realize it or not, this building could be destroyed but it can be rebuilt. A fire could break out. I know it's a metal building, but just roll with me. A fire could break out and destroy the building, but it can be rebuilt. Friend of mine, their church, I've had several, actually, I've had actually had several friends that their churches has been destroyed by fires. And you know what? They've rebuilt. What we must understand is it's not about the facility but it is about where we are getting a connection between us and God. And people tell me all the time, oh, I can, I can, I can praise God at home. You know what? You're exactly right. Every one of us could have stayed, don't you do it. Every one of us could have stayed home, stayed in our pajamas, stretched back in that recliner, or Brother Larry go down and sit on the dock. And we could have we could have opened up live feed and watched. I couldn't have. That don't work for me. And we could have watched service today, right? But there's just something about joining together and being with others in the presence of God. And this is what Solomon is telling us. This is what he's talking about. We're reminded the focus is on God and the relationship that we, his people, have with him. And the relationship that he has with us. Verse 5, Solomon reminded them. He says, in verse 5, he said, remember when we was in Egypt, bondage? We didn't have a tabernacle. We didn't have a temple. But we still worship God. Even in the midst of our storms, even in the midst of our trials, even in the midst of circumstances, we can still worship God. This is a reminder of their heritage, where God brought them from, to where God is taking them to. God had promised them through Abraham that God was going to preserve Abraham's seed for generations to come. And so for five centuries, God had not chosen a particular place, a particular city for the children of God to dwell. That God had not chosen for a particular place for a temple to be built. But he had chosen the people. We must understand, God chose us. We chose the building. Does that make sense? And as much as we need to realize this, y'all, please don't understand, don't misunderstand me. I'm glad we got this building. I don't know what the temperature is outside right now, but we're still under a heat advisory. You know what the temperature outside is? Hot. Hot. Y'all, are you seeing what I'm saying? 
How many is glad we are in a building that's got air conditioner and it feels really good? Yes, hallelujah, glory to God. But the fact of it remains is God chose us, not a building. We are the built, we are the children of God, not this building. It's about our relationship with God. A building dedicated to God serves multiple purposes. But buildings do not minister to people. They only facilitate that ministry. We have Sunday school classes upstairs. Those rooms do not teach the Sunday school class. They facilitate those teachers teaching the Sunday school class. Does that make sense? Our culture tends to take the awesome reality of who God is and the worthiness of God and our, our, our culture tends to downsize Him and put Him in our little box. The way we talk about Him, the way we pray, the way we live shows that we've somehow lost the sense of being awestruck about the presence and the holiness, the all-powerfulness of who God is. I've done some church consulting, and and I've talked to churches before, and I've told them, they'll say, uh, we want to try to do this. They'll say a project, but we're just a small little church. We can't do that. And then what I, I have the privilege of telling them, I'll say, well, I pastor one of those small town country churches. And we don't have a small town mentality about ourselves. And a small church mentality about ourselves. What does that mean? That means whenever whenever we're wanting to do a project or we're wanting to bless a ministry or we're wanting to do something in the mission field, what do we do? We seek God that God's going to multiply and God always supplies the need. Because it's not about what I can do, it's about what God is going to do through us. Amen? God has always done great and wonderful things. And we look back and we think, how in the world did that happen? But God, do you see what I'm saying? We need to quit downsizing who God is, and we need to say, God is much bigger than just you and I. God is a great big God, and what else can God do in our lives? Take a look at verse uh, 10 and 11. Verse 10 and 11, it says this, Now the Lord had fulfilled His promise that He made, For I have risen in the palace of David, my father, and sit on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised. And I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. Verse 11. And there I have set the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord, that he made with with the people of Israel. The intent to build the temple was not born in the heart of God, but in the heart of David. 2 Chronicles 6 and verse 7 tells us that. Solomon reminded the people that although David, David's warring spirit, David had a warring spirit and that prevented him from being the one to build the temple or complete the temple, God found David's heart to be right before him He raised up his son Solomon to build the temple instead of David. As God told the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, 1 Samuel 16 and 7, he says this, The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. What happened, what would have happened if David's dream, if one of his other sons had succeeded in an earlier coup attempt that we read about earlier uh, several weeks ago? Israel would not have been at peace and the temple would not have been built. There was a lot of things that happened, a lot of cleaning up. A lot of things that had to take place in order for David 
to get the children of Israel to where they was at so the temple could be built. A lot of times God is trying to clean house in our lives. We just need to let him. Amen. So let's go on to Solomon's prayer of dedication. Solomon's prayer of dedication. You can take a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 12 through 14. We're going to look at verse 12 and then 14 and then 17. Verse 12, Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands. Verse 14, and Solomon said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant, showing steadfast love toward your servants who walk before you with all of their heart. What we're looking at here and what we're seeing, go on to verse 17. We'll read that. Verse 17. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, let your word be confined, or excuse me, confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David. Solomon positioned himself for the dedication service. He stood before the altar. There was a bronze altar that he had constructed. He was the king and not a priest. King Solomon humbly dedicated the temple outside the most holy place. He did not go in the holy place. The king surrendered to protocol recognizing the holy place and the most holy place were reserved for the priesthood only. This protocol was designed and it maintained its enforcement until Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, becoming our faithful high priest in things pertaining to to God. Solomon's posture as he offered the prayers before God is something we need to take note of. In the presence of all the people, he stood with his arms outstretched before the heavens. He demonstrated by kneeling on his knees the humility that he needed before God. Even though he was king, he was submitting towards the allness of who God is. You are not so high that you cannot be humbled before God. I don't care how many letters you have before your name. I don't care how many letters you have after your name. I don't care how much is in your checking account, your savings account. You need to humble yourself before God. The the prayer that Solomon submitted is not unlike the manner which Jesus taught his disciples in saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's also like the the prayer that Paul taught, and he was teaching that every petition needs to begin with prayer or praise and thanksgiving. When we go to God, we don't need to just go to God and say, okay, God, this is what I need. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But we need to go to God and giving God praise for what God's already done. We need to go to God and give God thanksgiving for what God's already done. And I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing wrong with praising God and thanking Him for what He's going to do in our lives. I go to God and I say, okay, God, you know, you go to God and you go, God, I thank you 
because of what you've done in my life. I thank you from where you brought me from. I give you praise for how you've worked in my life. I give you thankfulness for how you've developed, how you've processed. I give you praise for what you've done. And I'm thanking you for what you're continuing to do in our lives. We need to give God praise. Take a look at verse 19 through... Let's, we'll take a look at verse 19 through 21, and then we're going to look at verse 41 and 42. 19 through 21. Yet have regard to the power of your servant, or excuse me, to the prayer of your servant and to his plea. O Lord, my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you. Verse 20. That your eyes may be opened day and night toward this house, the place where you have promised to set your name, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers towards this place. Verse 21. And listen to the pleas of your servant and of your people, Israel, when they pray toward this place. And listen from heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. Now look at verse 41. 41 tells us, And now arise, O Lord God, go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priest, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let your saints rejoice in your goodness. Verse 42. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love for David, your servant. Solomon, he gives a prayer and he indicates that the house, the temple, this temple that has been built, that's been dedicated to the worship and the service of God, Solomon's prayer indicates that this temple is going to stand in contrast, contrast to the shrines of the pagan gods and the nations that surround Israel. Okay, you've got to realize that the children of Israel has been in Egypt. What was there in Egypt? You know, around here in Alabama, everywhere you go, every about 10 miles, you see a Dollar General. You go about 10 more. Look, there's some towns that ain't got a red light, but they got a Dollar General. I've often wondered, will they be a dollar general in heaven? And I'm sure there's already one built in hell. Okay? Here's the thing that we've got to realize and understand. Just like we see dollar generals and Walmarts and things like that everywhere, in Egypt, on every street corner, there was another shrine. There was another building built to the worship of a of a false god. Buddha. There was temples. There was, there was probably a Buddha sitting everywhere. A little Buddha. But people walk up and rub his belly. Thinking something's going to happen. There's another temple that's made out of. Or a shrine made out of wood. That somebody had built to some, some something something god. They had gods to the cows. The goats. The wheat field, the sun, the moon. I mean, you got gods to everything. That's not much unlike what we have today. We don't have shrines built everywhere, but in some cases we may do. But we many people have built shrines up in their lives towards the false gods that we worship. Brother Andy, I don't worship any false gods. I'm going to say two words or three words, and then I'm just going to move forward because some people would have this as a false god, and I'm not going to try to step on this one because it might get somebody mad, and they might throw a book at me. But some people, Alabama-Auburn football. Let's just move on. What we've got to realize and understand is there's times that even in our lives, we've people have built up shrines unknowingly to false gods, unknowingly. But what Solomon is, de- when in the dedication to the temple, 
that's been built for the children of Israel to the God of Israel. He's showing them, hey, God's going to stand regardless of what happens over there. You know, in 20 years after the dedication of this temple, 20 years goes by, the temple's still there. That wooden statue that had been engraved to the, to the God of the cows, termites got a hold of it. Down the next street corner, there had been a wooden, a wooden shrine had been built to the God of the moon. Well, the fire last week took that one out. But the temple's still here. And that goes fast forward even to today's time. Where's the holies of holies in the most holy place now? It ain't here. It ain't here. Although we recognize this altar area as being a holy place set aside to God. But this ain't the holy place. This ain't the most holy place. Even though this area is an area dedicated to lead this congregation into worship. There's still reverence needs to be, but this ain't the most holy place. This ain't the, where's the most holy place? Where's the presence of God at now? Right here. This building could be torn down. And you know what we'd do? We could put up a pop-up tent on the same spot if we wanted to. Yes, we'd get a lot of fans down here. We'd get portable air conditioning just for you. And we, we could still have church. What, what city is that? What city is that, John David, that y'all have a, that tent revival at? In Carrollton, Alabama, right? Carrollton, Alabama. They, they've got a tent revival going on. They do it every so often. It ain't going on right now. Every so often there's a tent revival going on. It ain't a, it ain't a building like this. They don't have chandeliers. They ain't an air conditioning, although I, I know they wish there was. <laughs> but the fact of it is, it's not about this. It's about the presence of God. And that's what Solomon in the dedication was emphasizing. He was saying, in mind in your language today, he was saying, church, let's get a hold of God. Let's get a hold of God. Solomon concluded his prayer by recognizing the Word of God and the presence of God. The stone tablets, they had gathered those and they had been placed in the Ark of the Covenant by Moses. And that Ark had arrived at its resting place, verse 41, with the intention that it would never be moved again. We know that it was stolen. That's just like today. People, people try to steal. Um, they try, people today try to steal. I'm not going to say the presence of God, but people try to steal what we focus on as the presence of God. People still do those same things today. People still take their focus instead of their focus being on the presence of God is focused on other things, and yet they still stu and they stumble and they fall when we do that. It's never to say that we're not going to have problems and trials when we focus on when we when we focus on the presence of God. We're still going to go through troubles. We're still going to go through trials. There's still things going to happen. Bad things still happen, but we can make it to the other side if we're focused on God. Amen. So let's go on. A church without prayer is an absurdity. Why are we here if we don't have prayer? If we're not praying to God, why are we here? A church without prayer is nothing more than a warm corpse. It is dead. A church without a prayer life a body of believers without a prayer life is a dead body of believers. Prayer breathes the breath of life into the soul of the church. It is the means which the Spirit of God guides and empowers the church. 
We want God to guide us. We want God to direct us. Quit looking at televangelists 4,025. Let's start looking at God. There's nothing wrong with, with, with books and, and televangelists. I, I, got, I got a bunch of books in my office. I love books. If I've got an addiction, it's two things, chocolate and books. I love books. But the fact of the matter is, I can get more about being in the presence of God than I can of all of those books put together. There's nothing wrong with watching a televangelist on TV. I've had some in our church live feed. I've had some of you. You'll, you'll text me, so-and-so, teach, so-and-so was teaching the other day on TV, and they said such-and-such. That reminded me of something you said. So-and-so was preaching on TV, and they said such-and-such. I love those things. But that in and of itself is not the presence of God. We need prayer times. Let's wrap this up. This Sunday school lesson up by looking at people respond and God speaks. People respond and God speaks. Take a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles 7 starting in verse 1. Let's read verses 1 through... 6. 2 Chronicles 7, starting in verse 1. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from the heavens and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Boy, what a powerful thing. Look at verse 2. The priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord Filled the Lord's house. Look at on at verse 3. Verse 3 tells us, When all the people of Israel saw the fire had come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they got their cell phones out and they played Yahtzee, Farmville. They tweeted about it. They got on Facebook. They took a picture and posted it on Instagram. Sister Nellie, is that what it says? It didn't say that. Did I make all that up? I tend to do that sometimes, don't I? But what does it actually say? It says, when all the people saw what God was doing and the presence of the Lord came down on that temple. They set all the distractions aside. They laid their cell phones down. They wasn't worried about what was in the crock pot at home. They bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement. It wasn't on carpet. Sister Nellie, I don't think they had padded pews. They didn't have air conditioning. It says they bow down on the pavement and worship and give thanks to the Lord, saying, for he, God, is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that the love of God endures forever. Amen. Let's, uh, I, I ain't going to ever finish. You, you can go back and read, these, read the rest of these verses. Let's go on. Let's look at this. Because I'm going to try to get to some place maybe to finish. If we were to begin our reading without the events that was in chapter 6, chapter 5, we would just conclude to ourselves that God just came down on the temple because the people worshipped God, but that would be an inaccurate appraisal. Worship is a part of it. Prayer is a part of it. Proclamation is a part of it. Proclamation and prayer came first. They proclaimed that God was going to do something, and guess what? God did it. They had faith 
even though they didn't really know what faith was, that God was going to move, and God did it. They had prayed and sought God first, and God moved, and God worked among his people. God is sovereign, therefore, and can therefore suspend the natural order to demonstrate his power as he wills. But most often in Scripture, the presence of God follows prayer, praise, and worship of God's people to God. On the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 41, you can go back and you can read those Scriptures, and you find that on the day of Pentecost, 120 people, came into an upper room, they prayed, and they sought the face of God, and then the presence of God filled the house where they was at. When they had seen the glory, when the people of the children of Israel seen the glory, the people bowed down their face and began to worship and praise God. It was not, oh, it was not stage-driven from a bronze platform. It was not a request from the leadership. It was not orchestrated by the pastor or the priest. The singers did not say, Oh, I need everybody to clap your hands and worship God. Nope. Everything happened because the people, verse 3, they worshiped God. Look, I didn't come here to see none of y'all. Matter of fact, every one of you could have stayed home. I'm glad you didn't. Marty, I'm glad you came to see me. You came just to see me, didn't you? That's what I thought. I'm glad we come here. But you know what, Brother Chuck? If nobody would have come to church today and it would have just been me, myself, and I, I'm going to worship God. And that's the mentality that we've got to have. When we come into this house, it's not about who's sitting beside us. It's not about who's playing the piano. It's not about who's singing. Oh, I know her life or I know his life. They ain't living for God. I know they got such and such and such and such. I know, I know, I know, I know. You know nothing because what we're supposed to be doing is worshiping God. It's not about who's up here. It's not about who's preaching. It's not about who the pastor is. It is about being in the presence of God. Amen. That's what Solomon was trying to teach us and tell us. The response ensued from not only Solomon, but it ensued from all the people. Why? Because they beheld the glory of God. Look at verse 12. Verse 12 tells us this. The Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I've heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. On the night shortly after Solomon dedicated the temple, the Lord appeared to Solomon as he had done time and time again. He appeared and he told him, I have heard your prayer and I've chosen this place to be a house of sacrifice. Church, this building has been dedicated to the place of worship to God and that's what we need to do when we come in. When we come into this house, it's not about seeing somebody. But it is about worshiping God. This is a house of prayer. This is a house of worship. This is a house of sacrifice. This is a house that's been dedicated to God. But as I said a moment ago, these tornadoes, these, this weather's been bad here lately. The weather's been bad. A tornado come, could have come through and tore this building down. We can still gather to worship God. And that's what it's all about. Look at the last thing. Take a look at verse 17 and 18. 
And as for you, if you walk before me as David, your father walked, doing according to all that I've commanded to you, keeping my statues and keeping my rules, verse 18, I will establish your royal throne. You do what I've told you to do. You you follow my commands. You follow my statues. You follow my word. You follow what I've laid out before you. I'm going to establish you. Many times, look, I see this. I see this in pastors, and I see this in preachers, and I see this in evangelists. I see this in when people come th- come through the ministerial credentialing part of the Church of God as as exhorters and ordained ministers and ordained bishops. They'll come through and. I'm established, I'm arrived, the anointing of the Lord is on me. But they they forget that's opposite of what's supposed to happen. I'm supposed to worship God. I'm supposed to lean on God. I'm supposed to follow the commands that God's laid out in His Word. I'm supposed to follow the statues and the and and what God has. I'm supposed to live a life like Christ. And when I do that, then God's going to establish you. If we do those things, God is going to make the way straight. God is going to pave the path before you. No matter what ministry, no matter what area of ministry God's called you in. Sunday school teacher, to be a pastor of a church, to be the janitor. If we do what God's called us to do, God's going to pave the path before us. He is going to take care of the things in front of us. He's going to establish us. And he says, you shall not lack a man to rule in Israel. He told Solomon, he said, you do what I've commanded you follow my commands, you follow my statutes, you follow the Word of God in mine and your language. You follow what the Word of God has laid out. And I'm going to take care of everything about your kingdom. I'm going to establish a royal throne for you to be on. That tells you and I that if we will do what God has called us to do, we'll follow the footsteps God's commanded in our lives. God is going to take care of all else in our lives. Amen. Last thing. To Israel, there were two places God chose to dwell and meet his people. The tabernacle, which was the temporary house, and the permanent place, which was the temple. In the New Testament, we are told that in John chapter 14 and verse 17, we're, in to- we're told that the Holy Spirit has chosen this temple to dwell. Not this building, but this temple between our shoulder blades. To the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul tells them, in mine in your language, Paul says this. Hey, bozo, do you not know that you're the temple of the holy God? Act like it. Do you not know that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Act like it. That's what God's chosen for us. We're not our own. We've been bought and paid for by the blood of the Lamb. We need to act like that. When we dedicate our lives to the Lord, we do so with every intention that Solomon had. We're determined to do the will of God and behold God's glory. We become recipients of the promises and the blessings, the provisions and the glory of God. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, they will keep my word. Church, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to show the love of God, and in doing so, we're going to keep the Word of God in our lives. Too many times people are worried about everything else, but we need to be focused on worshiping and serving Almighty God. Amen? Live feed, thank you so much for joining us for our Sunday school class. Join us back at 11 o'clock for our Sunday morning worship. May the good Lord bless you is our prayer. Amen and amen.